Mark, I want to know where you were raised, where you went to high school, college, and law school. Well, I was raised in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, I attended the University of Texas at Austin, graduated in 1977 with a, a BBA. Didn't really know what I wanted to do, so I ventured off to law school at St. Mary's in San Antonio and graduated from there with my JD in 1980. Tell me about your family background, your mom and dad, and what it was like growing up. Well, I uh, was actually born in Austin in 1955. My daddy was in pharmacy school down at the University of Texas in Austin. My mother was a registered nurse, and uh, I come from a, a family that had been in the drugstore business in Fort Worth for, up until 1994, spanned 68 years. Uh, Daniel Drug and Daniel Pharmacy. And uh, my dad was a pharmacist and owned two stores, and that's what I, I essentially grew up in those stores, what I did, working from as far back as I can remember, uh, whether it was pouring coffee or mopping floors or uh, pulling fixtures or restocking, and uh, where it's been every summer, essentially, working 40, 50 hours a week in drug stores. Mother was a nurse. Did not actually work outside her home. She passed away when I was 13 years old, and uh, continued living Fort Worth till such time as I went off to college and law school. What was it like growing up without a mom? That's a good question. And here I am, 52 years old, and that still strikes a uh, strikes a nerve. I had a, a wonderful mother, and uh, she was very ill. From I was about four years till I was 13 years old with a disease called scleroderma. Uh, at the time, there were only three people in the country been diagnosed with it. It potentially attacked, attacked every organ in the body, but she was very, very ill. And uh, like I said, she passed when I was 13. We say, growing up, it, it's funny, it, uh, something like that probably makes you grow up a little bit quicker than you would ordinarily. And all of a sudden, you go from 13 to about 16, and 16 to about 19, and, and project on out. So um, that uh, that was a unique experience. Any brothers or sisters? I have an older brother, two years older than me. His name is Burl. Younger brother, four years, named David. Uh, my father remarried shortly after my mom's death, and acquired a couple of stepsisters that uh, still live in Fort Worth. What made you want to go to law school? It's funny. Everybody has that story. I went to law school. I went to law school, uh, started in 1977. If I had to think back as far as an inspiration, I had a privilege in 1975 to go out to uh, Hawaii for the summer and met a man named Michael Marks, who I stay in touch with to this day. He was a business law teacher, took a business law class for him. And there was something about his presence, something about his stature, something about his, his command that uh, just generated respect. There's something about him being a lawyer that I was so very much intrigued with. The following year, uh, back at the University of Texas, I was taking some insurance and finance courses. There's a man named Joe Duckworth, who I still stay in contact to this day, who was a lawyer and also uh, uh, in the financial planning business, actually did pension plans at that time. And Joe Duckworth was a lawyer and taught a class on pensions. He and I struck up a very close relationship. He was the utmost of a professional. Uh, he was the teacher that came to, to class every day in a coat and tie with a briefcase and had a composure and stature about him. There's just something about the profession that I was intrigued by the amount of respect these men generated. And probably from the, the combination of both those men coming in to contact with him over a period of spanning nine months. I knew there was something I wanted to be part of that. didn't know what exactly area pro law I wanted to practice in, but I, I wanted to be part of that. And if I had to look back at an inspiration, uh, I, it would start with those two men. What got you, can, can you see the glasses on there? No. Okay. Um, what got you interested in criminal law and in particularly criminal defense? Well, it's another good story. I'm almost uh, flattered you mask, but okay. uh, I got interested. As, as far as me becoming interested in criminal law, I don't know that I was as I went to law school. In the summer of 1979, I was 
preparing for some summer clerkships, I wanted to gravitate towards coming back to Fort Worth. And I remember making a number of applications to a lot of the firms throughout Fort Worth, and I also sent one to the Tarrant County District Attorney's Office, which uh, I think I've been urged to do that by a lawyer. This is actually a good story if anybody pays attention. That was back in a time when nobody really had uh, there weren't any voicemail, there weren't any telephone recording systems, either were there to get a call or not. I remember I was leaving on spring break to come to Fort Worth, had about six interviews lined up. And in life sometimes there's just fate. But I had gotten off work at the farm I was working at, went to my apartment, I had packed my car, I was ready to pull out of the parking lot to come to Fort Worth for my spring break series of interviews. And I had interviews lined up with five or six firms, and I knew I'd get one of them. And I had to go back to my apartment for some reason. This is 4.45 on a Friday afternoon. And when I was in that apartment for those two minutes, that phone rang. And it was a lady at the Terry County District Attorney's Office that said, we just got your resume a few weeks back. It's been laying here. We hadn't even looked at it, but we just looked at it. Are you still coming up here to interview? And the answer was yes. And, uh, so I interviewed with them and, and actually thought that looked a little more fun than sitting around some civil firm all summer. And got involved in a, a case at that time. The district attorney's office was prosecuting a man named Cullen Davis. Kent, and I'm just going to break that up in case they want to <coughs> clip it out. Tell me about the Cullen Davis case. Well, there were two Cullen Davis cases. One case involved the, the death of his uh, stepdaughter, uh, Andre Welburn, that had been killed in 1976, had been prosecuted initially in Fort Worth, and this trial was declared and got moved to Amarillo, and Cullen was acquitted along about 77, 78. Uh, six months later, there was he was arrested for a conspiracy to uh, capital murder for remuneration of a district judge presiding over his divorce proceeding. And that case had been sent to Houston to be tried and was tried to a hung jury. And they were preparing for the retrial in the fall of 1979. And what was intriguing is I was asked to do some work on it. In, in retrospect, it was it was very minimal uh, work, but it, it caught my attention caused me to see there's more involved in criminal law than just moving paper from one side of your desk to another and filing pleadings. You're dealing with human beings and, and all the blood and guts that go into what we do. And it, it just grabbed me and, and made me fascinated with the field of criminal law. I decided at that moment, uh, the summer of 79, I was going to be involved in criminal law in some aspects. And obviously the, that was going to take the course of coming back there and going to work as a prosecutor once I graduated the following year. Tell me what got you interested in criminal defense work. Well, I had prosecuted with uh, Terry Andrews Attorney's Office for three years, from May of 1977. I got interested in I got interested in criminal defense work because I had prosecuted the district attorney's office from May of 1977 to May of 1980. Uh, it was a good experience, but uh, I got to see the people above me that, uh, what you call the career long-term folks versus the short-term folks. And, uh, I quite frankly had uh, had greater visions in life with an expansive career. Anybody that stays in prosecution, it's my opinion, that it, it becomes routine after a while and, and there's no room for growth. It's the same thing over and over and over. Um, I saw folks on the defense side that every case was different, every day was different, every client was different, every fact situation was different. Um, and I knew from the day I went to work as a prosecutor that that's where I was headed. I didn't know if it would be two years, three years, or five years, but it sure wasn't going to be six years that I would be doing that. And quite candidly, I fashioned my work as a prosecutor destined for that day. Back in those days, if I had a good lawyer on the side, I'd steal every motion he had and started my files. Um, I would go to lunch with defense lawyers and pick their brains as to 
how they dealt with clients, how they dealt with fees, how they set fees. A lot of times they wouldn't tell me their secrets, but it wouldn't keep me from asking and asking again because I just wanted to know. If you had to name one <coughs> TCDLA member that's been most influential in your career, who would it be and why? As far as an influential member of TCDLA, that's a, that's a two-foot putt for me. You knew the answer to that question before you asked. It would be Tim Evans, uh, and, and most everybody knows Tim. Uh, he and I began practicing all together in 1985 sharing office space and bills, but there's been so many countless evenings and Saturdays and even Sundays where we have uh, brainstormed situations and, and shared advice, but uh, I've been the receiver much more than I've been the giver. I have picked his brain from, uh, from every aspect of criminal practice you can imagine. Uh, he and I have had the privilege of trying cases together. He has sound judgment. Is careful in what he does, and I have just learned immensely from him not just how to try lawsuits and how to represent clients, but uh, just a sound judgment in approaching life in general uh, and certainly what we do. You've been a, a prosecutor uh, and a defense lawyer. Tell us what uh, the difference is between prosecuting citizens and defending citizens. Well, I got a lot more not guilty as a prosecutor than I did a defense lawyer, and I'm awfully proud of that. <laughs> no. Um, it's funny when you say, well, what's the difference of prosecuting citizens versus defending? Um, if I had to look back at, at just prosecution, it's been so long ago, and so many things have changed, but I know when I came through that, that period of time, and over across the river in Dallas in our neighboring county, there was a philosophy that existed of, of some undeniable urge to win. Uh, prosecutors are ambitious and should be. We all should be ambitious in what we do. But um, when I came through it, there wasn't as much attention devoted to educating the young prosecutors on their ethical responsibilities of revealing exculpatory evidence and, and, and the affirmative duty to seek out exculpatory evidence. And, uh, and more importantly, the quality of being a graceful, gentle, uh, a classy person, a, uh, a, a person who can, who can win graciously and lose graciously. Uh, it was also very personal back at that time. That was many years ago. But um, from the standpoint of, uh, I guess, for commenting on this video, I, I just, if I had to go back and do it again, or I had an opportunity to work with, with young folks coming out of law school and prosecuting, I would ensure uh, that time would be devoted to just ethical responsibilities, just basic professionalism. That this is a business, uh, it is a profession and practice. Uh, what happens in the courtroom happens and it can be left at the door. You go and be a human being and be collegial with the people you, you're opposing day in and day out. It's something I've learned and I don't know that I wish somebody had not taught me many years ago. Uh, as far as defending uh, people, you know, you. The folks that sit in the district attorney's offices, so very, very few of them truly know uh, about the emotions and, and passions that, that criminal defendants have. We represent people from all walks of life. We represent people who might be uh, professionals that find themselves in the crosshairs of criminal prosecution. We might represent somebody with a long criminal history, but they all are human beings and all God's creatures. And, uh, we must never lose sight of that. I see so many lawyers that uh, that I'm sorry to say I, I sometimes don't think they really even know who their client is. They didn't take time to ask. They didn't take time to find out. They read something off a police report, had a casual passing conversation, but they didn't take time to get to know somebody. Maybe somebody with a low IQ. Maybe somebody with a, uh, not a great deal of refinement in their in their social graces. But uh, they're one of God's creatures. They got to the position they are in life, usually for a combination of reasons, sometimes not of their own, own causing, own choosing. But we shouldn't ever lose sight of that. Uh, good lawyers don't. Uh, the good lawyers I associate with, Rick, just 
they know that client, they know it to be a human being. They can actually, the more you know your client, you can stand up and make an argument on their behalf, not only from your heart, but also you have the information to, to convey what a jury ought to know about them. Mark, this is going to be a, a difficult question for you to answer because I, I know you well enough. Um, but, but you're one of those lawyers that, that's always volunteering, speaking, going the extra mile. You're, you publish manuals to help lo other lawyers. Tell me why you're so involved in educating lawyers. Man, I don't know if there's a good answer for Rick. Why am I so involved in helping educating lawyers? Uh, I just gave a talk downstairs about two hours ago on self-defense and jury selection. I began that talk with a comment to the to the course attendees that um, I have stolen more from speakers at TCLA functions than anybody in this room. And I have attended more seminars where I've sat there and pulled snippets from one guy and used it and pulled snippets from another guy and used it and tried to combine it into a successful recipe. And what we do is uh, is ever changing. I mean, I, this is an ongoing learning process. I don't. Uh, sometimes I think I'm fairly good at what I do, and I realize that the legislature huddled up, and, uh, or the prosecutors figured out how we do things and how to combat it. So we have to change our game. Uh, I enjoy sharing because I have shared and stolen so much from others, and I think we all have a a common uh, goal in improving what we do. I don't know that we ever reach the pinnacle where we can't get better at what we do. So um, I devote time to it because I love the profession. I want it to be a profession. Uh, I want us to be the best we can be, and that just never stops. That's on the goal. You're very compassionate in your involvement with TCDLA. Tell us when you became a member and how long you've been a member, how you've seen the association evolve, and what it's meant to you? I became a member in 1984. Um, I've been a member since that time. Actually, I had to take one year off. Bob Hinton was president. I was so embarrassed for the association that year that I just didn't want to stay part of it with Bob Hinton as president. No, that's being facetious. Leave that in there. <laughs> but, no, uh, wait a minute, no. Leave that, leave that in there and just smile. <laughs> no, no there, there was a mass exodus the year Bob was president. We lost. Uh, we lost 600 members that year, but Bob didn't view that as a problem. He thought he could reproduce that many in like 60 days. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mark, t tell us wh when you became a member of TCDLA, why you're so compassionate um, in your involvement in the club and how it's evolved since you became a member. I became a member of TCLA in 1984. Uh, at that time, there was the Criminal Defense Lawyers Project, which is our sister project, which is holding a few seminars around the state, uh, nuts and bolts type seminars, three or four a year. And we'd have one or two seminars. There wasn't a whole lot of CLE. We'd try to have the quarterly meetings around uh, opportunities where we'd have seminars where people could travel in, but there just wasn't a whole lot of, of the CLE function at that time. If you remember, the uh, State Bar of Texas uh, had compulsory CLE began in 1983, and, and just like every other organization in, in, uh, in law, T. Slade took a few years to they saw the opportunities that, that would afford them to not only share, but also generate revenue from seminars. And that didn't really start until about 86 or 87. The State Bar used to have a full command on the premier criminal law seminars in the state. We'd have some little groups with 30 or 40 people show up but not the massive numbers we now see at the Rusty Duncan. Um, when I began, I was one of the people sitting in the sitting in the seminars, paying attention, learning, stealing, plucking motions out of outlines. Uh, I'd hear about good lawyers, and I'd make sure to arrange my schedule around to, to make sure I could hear what they had to say. Um, and to me, that was that's just a gift, because I talked about sharing earlier. I mean, those, those are people that have shared with me, and, and I've had a chance to steal ideas from them. So one of the neat parts of TCLA is to watch that grow. I and mean, I, I remember three years ago, we put on like 28 programs in a year, and even more now. So uh, I've seen that over the past, uh, I guess the past 24 years, just flourish into 
something that is tenfold of what it was when it began. And, and CLE has always been important, but it uh, it's just taken on a life of its own, and should. That, that's part of what we should do is educate those who, who need help. What would you say to a, uh, a lawyer, young or old, um, thinking about joining the club? Why should someone be a member of TCLA? Well, the beautiful, the reason a person should be a member of TCLA, uh, that's tough to answer. The main thing is a young lawyer, so many lawyers throughout Texas are scattered into rural communities, small towns, where there's a one horse, one judge in the district, one judge in the county. And he handles the divorces, and he handles the uh, civil litigation, and then all of a sudden he handles the criminal stuff too. And there may not be another criminal lawyer within 30 miles. And those people are on the island by themselves. Now they may have a little guidance some judge gives them, or maybe some other lawyer gives them, but without the infrastructure of TCLA to pick up the phone and call a member and ask or come to a seminar or have the materials that educate you. Those lawyers sit out there and they don't grow and they don't provide the quality representation they could. That is so unique about TCLA is they can reach out and help the lawyers who are practicing law, who do not have some firm structure around them and they can make a solo practitioner into a heck of a good lawyer. We've done it time and time and time again. From the lawyers maybe in the in the metropolitan areas, uh, like it or not, criminal lawyers are largely seen as solo practitioners. It's just the, it's the makeup of what we do. Our type of practice is more conducive to individual practitioners. Uh, some of those may be associated with folks and office sharing arrangements, but so many of us are out there by ourselves. And T. Slade provides a common ground not only to uh, to bounce your to bounce your fact situations off of your cases. Uh, it provides a, uh, a fertile area to learn. It provides a fertile area to uh, meet other lawyers and associate the right people in the right cases because many times you need other lawyers to, to be involved. I was speaking down downstairs two hours ago and finished up uh, my talk on self-defense. There were six young lawyers that came up that had a case involving some aspect of self-defense. In all fairness, they hadn't, they hadn't tried a self-defense case before. They all had questions and part of what I think my responsibility is, is do what I did. I sat there for 40 minutes trying to address every one of those questions as best I could to give them some guidance, assistance, advice, including handing them a card and saying, as you get closer to your trial, if you need some help or you, you want to bounce an idea off me, I'll be happy to address it. One of the beautiful things of of practicing criminal law is to have somebody else there to bounce an idea off of because so many times we have ideas that, that sound good to us while we got our head on the pillow but when it's actually done in a court it may have a negative result it may, or may bring about uh, some rebuttal type evidence you really don't want to hear and it's not a bad thing to have an individual bounce something off. TCLA provides that. To them. Hey, I'm asking that for off tape right now. Think about your strike force involvement. Do, do you have a significant strike force uh, case Story. I can ask you about? Yeah, but I can't talk about it. Okay. Uh, can, I'm going to ask you about strike force in general then. Okay. Mark, um, tell me about the uh, TCDLA strike force and what it does and why it's in, an invaluable asset for a member. Or benefit, I guess. Tisla Strike Force is not just a benefit, it is an absolute resource. Uh, what I talked about a few minutes ago concerning the solo practitioner who might find himself getting bullied by a judge, by a prosecutor unfairly. Uh, we so many times sit on the island and feel alone. Uh, the Strike Force provides an individual member through nothing more than a phone call. The entire resource, not just TCLA, but competent, quality lawyers standing by his side to defend him in a situation where he is unfairly and unfortunately targeted, whether it be a contempt action, whether it be some other extraordinary action by a judge or prosecutor that, that may just not be fair, it may not be unlawful, but just may not be fair, maybe just maybe when the 
person exerting that that authority sees this person that's sitting out there alone but has the force of some competent, qualified, highly visible, recognized lawyer standing by their side saying this ain't right with a brief bank to back them up, all of a sudden that person isn't sitting on that island by themselves. That person has a resource. Now, in, in defense of the strike force, uh, we don't take every every single complaint that ever comes through the through the filter. Uh, many of those, sometimes we find lawyers actually did something that they shouldn't have done. And, and, and I think lawyers need to know that they just can't call every time they do something stupid. And lawyers do things stupid. Um, but it's when they're unfairly treated, unfairly targeted, that that resource is there by your side. And it's awfully comforting. I've used it myself. I've been part of it. Um, it, it is, it's a special day. It's a special day when TSLA Strike Force shows up. People that do it are compensated not a penny. The people that do it are not paid for their expenses and their travel. They show up by that lawyer's side because it's the right thing to do. Mark, you're a competitive guy. You try a lot of cases. What would you say, uh, especially to the young lawyer who hasn't had a lot of courtroom experience that might give them the courage to go in there and start trying cases? Well, if nothing else, um, TCLA has taken a focus on DWI work in the last five years as far as educating lawyers and uh, more CLE work in that area. The truth of the matter is you can try DWI as worst any county in this, in this state if your person doesn't have a, a prior conviction of some kind and he didn't run over the mayor's daughter, there's a pretty good chance he'll be routinely probated. Uh, and last time I checked, everybody that pled guilty in the courthouse, got found guilty. So those are what I call no-lose trials. If there's ever a fertile ground for a young lawyer to to pick up his his notepad and grab his penal code, code for procedure, and go to the courthouse and try a case, those are excellent opportunities. They can be tried in a couple of days. You're cross-examining two or three witnesses a case. You're selecting a jury. And I don't know how to say this in a nice way, but I think I heard one time, you don't get good at sex unless you do it. You don't get good at trying cases unless you do it. The first time you do it, your left knee is pounding the heck out of your right knee. Uh, you are nervous, you are not smooth, you are not very good. But you don't get better because you sit in your office. You don't get better because you sit up next to your client in front of the judge and are completely guilty. You got better because you litigated the case. Uh, I would urge young lawyers to go find cases such as that that they can go try by themselves and also find old, older lawyers to go sit in second chair with and let you do it. But you don't ever get good by watching somebody else till you do it yourself. How long have you been practicing, Mark? 27 years. Okay. Um, I've been practicing 27 years, Rick. <laughs> no. Um, you've been practicing 27 years. Tell me, and you've had hundreds of trials, What's it feel like today going into a courtroom as opposed to when we first started? Going into a courtroom to try a case, but what does that feel like to you today? Well, I'm comfortable going to the courtroom, just like many of the folks in this association leadership. They've tried hundreds of cases. It's a place you're comfortable. But to say I am comfortable every time I go to a courtroom is a misstatement. I, uh, I still had to prepare meticulously. If I'm not prepared, which I don't ever remember going to court and not be prepared, that's when I'm nervous. Um, it doesn't take any less work today than it did 27 years ago. In fact, I think sometimes it may take more. But uh, I think successful lawyers are lawyers that, that work on a case from the standpoint of planning everything they're going to do. They're going to plan their jury selection and, and carefully crafted questions to some of the jurors making sure their challenges and calls for cause are well developed. I think you're successful because you you spent four to five hours not before working on an opening statement that is fluid, prepared, and hits the points. You thought about how your words were going to sound and you tweaked them and changed them and made sure it delivered a very concise message. You made sure they heard those words in jury selection, they heard an opening statement, they're going to hear it again in your final argument. I think you uh, are comfortable because you've 
have prepared for your cross-examination. You don't ever uh, have witnesses trot in, lean over your co-counsel and say, who is this? Uh, you know who they are. You know what they're going to say. You have every report they ever generated. You know what they're made of, what their experience is. You know, you have their T-close records and know if they actually really went to some of their schools they said they went to. And then you know what you're going to ask them and you know how you're going to ask them. Uh, that makes me comfortable as far as going to prepare. And then I make, I make certain that I've, I've also planned on in case presentation, I'll make it for going to, but you also always have to plan for a punishment phase. Uh, that's what makes successful lawyers is, is planning and work. There's not a way to do it that uh, doesn't require work. Uh, and that's all we ever, if I had to tell a young lawyer that's all we ever be successful is work and work and work. Uh, I'm going to ask you a series of questions about this recent death case that you had, and I want to uh, break it up. Uh, first one's going to be tell me his name, what he was charged with, and, you know, what the facts were. Then I want to uh, ask you another question about the defense, the trial, the verdict, etc. Okay, so uh, tell me the name of this re name of your man on this recent capital case. You know, so and so was accused of the death penalty, and what he was accused of doing. Recent capital case I was involved in was. Uh case called Stephen Hurd. Uh, he was charged with capital murder caused the death of a police officer by shooting the police officer after back in November 2005. Steve was a, a parolee and been running from his parole officer and other law enforcement folks for several weeks and actually been in a high-speed chase several nights before this happened. Police had come to a, a mobile home he was living in and uh, to execute a warrant for him two people at the house told the police he wasn't there. They asked to come on anyway. He was in a, a bedroom just off the front area of the house. And, uh, the police officer opened the door and made some statements to the effect of he's in here, he's in here. There's actually a dispute about whether uh, they said he had a gun or not. But Steve had, had been in this room. There was an issue about whether he heard the exchange at the front door of these other two people. It was our position he didn't. I think the fiscal evidence showed that out. We actually didn't significant testing on, on the sound uh, conduction through the home. Um, and right after that door opened, Steve was in that room. Steve had a gun in his hand, standing in a closet pointing in the air. Why, I don't know. But all hell broke loose. And uh, Steve fell and hit the floor in this bedroom. And there were 34 shots that were directed and targeted into this room as he was laying on the floor with his gun that he should not have had. He uh, began firing blindly and aimlessly out the trailer through the window. And then the officer that got killed had stepped back across the doorway and there was a bullet that hit the door frame, ricocheted into my client's head, uh, to the deceased head, and caused his death. Uh, my client jumped out through a glass window ran to a home several blocks away and held a lady hostage for about four hours till, till he let her go and surrendered. It had an enormous amount of publicity in the Fort Worth area because we had not had a police officer die in the line of duty for like 23 years. Uh, there were billboards on most of the major highways uh, acknowledging uh, Officer Nava who had died. And, uh, most of the Fort Worth Police Department was wearing armbands as commemoration as was everybody in the city. And it was uh, pretty much the, uh, the force of the community marshaled against my client. Quite candidly, we uh, had done an extensive shooting reconstruction of the case. Uh, some of the experts we were using. Let me stop you there. Yes. Because okay. uh, I'm going to break that up into tell me about the defense. <clears throat> okay. Uh, tell me, um, and his name was Stephen Hurd. Tell me about the defense of Stephen Hurd. When you got the case, tell me how you uh, began preparing to defend it, to defend it, and how your defense evolved. Well, it was pretty interesting. Uh, this mobile home where the incident took place. The defense of Stephen Hurd. The defense of Stephen Hurd uh, was really pretty interesting. It involved some uh, rather unusual efforts on our part. This mobile home where the incident occurred. We determined very early on to be the 
would be the case. The physical evidence would, would tell us everything. We didn't know whether it was for us or against us. We didn't know at that time. We knew there had been a number of shots fired at him. We didn't know from what angles, uh, what directions, and how they traveled. So we had uh, fought very vigorously for the first month after the case to have access to this trailer with our court appointed experts. And we had a, a very good expert from Ford named Max Courtney. The, uh, we were kept being told that uh, for the police department still had command of the crime scene, and that took about 30 days after, which was after the incident, which is very unusual. Then all of a sudden it was turned over to us, and we uh, were told it's ours, and quite frankly, our expert wasn't available for two weeks, so we had to dig in our pocket to the town about 5,000 each, and post a security guard out there on this trailer, which had been given to us for two weeks to keep it preserved. Um, the case being the crime scene, being the physical evidence, uh, was a very complex scene. It involved 34 shots fired into a room my client was at, my client firing nine shots, and where those went and how they were targeted would tell a whole lot about his intent uh, and whether he was shooting blindly, aimlessly, or with some focus, and how the police officers shot where they shot from and the targeted projectile pass that they generated would tell us a great deal about what they saw. Um, three separate experts testified in the case, one for us, two for the prosecution, all agreed it was the most complex reconstruction they'd ever done. But uh, at the end of the day it showed that the officer Nava who was deceased had been hit essentially by a shot that uh, it ricocheted off a door frame and actually changed direction anywhere from four to six inches, depending on who you're believing. But the rest of my client's shots were, were very wild and blind and didn't have a lot of purpose to them, consistent with somebody laying on the floor, covering their head, firing back with no purpose. So we felt very confident of several things. Number one, that that would not show some focused intent or knowledge as is required for capital murder. Number two, we were uh, very comfortable with the fact that uh, somebody gets shot at 34 times, even by a police officer, that there might be some aspect of self-defense there. Um, number three, uh, to commit capital murder, you must know it's a peace officer. The officer that died was in plain clothes. There was an issue about whether my client actually heard what occurred in this room. We were pretty strong in our position. He did not or could not have heard it, in spite of a great deal of evidence and testimony to the contrary. So there were several lines of defense, but um, we were not entirely naive about that. We recognized that jurors might very well be prone to paint with a broader brush when they're dealing with a police officer and a police officer to death. And that was part of our focus in jury selection about if you can... Uh, well, let me stop you there. Go ahead. Um, start this next thought with the focus in jury selection on Stephen Heard was. Okay. In jury selection uh, in the Stephen Heard case, uh, we actually did something a little bit unusual. It seems like most self-defense cases, of course, the prosecution will go first, you follow them, and they will typically talk about all the elements of the offense and burdens of proof, and they kind of make self-defense sound like it's an afterthought. And to counter that, we spent a great deal of time planning our jury selection board hour, which was individual board hour, by the way, with 150 people questioned. But we had decided to start off jury selection with an idea of telling the jury this case has nothing to do with capital murder, nothing to do with the death penalty nothing to do with murdering lesser offense. This is all about, this case is all about the right of a person to defend themselves against another's un, unlawful use of deadly force, even if it's being propelled on that person by a police officer. And so we wanted to get that out of the forefront. We spent the first 30 minutes with each juror talking about self-defense and talking about police officers and how sometimes they can overreact and the normal people and they're subject to the same emotions as anybody else. Because we also determined that most people are to want to support the police and support law enforcement. So you can't go call a police officer 
some rotten, dirty, lying scoundrel. You instead have to call them a human being who might make mistakes, have misperceptions, overreact, and maybe do something that might be outside the bounds of the law. So we're conditioning in that regard. But at the same time, uh, in jury selection, we we felt so very comfortable with the uh, with the physical evidence of what it showed as supporting our position that uh, we wanted to spend some time with the jurors talking about physical evidence. And, uh, it's now 2007 when this tape is being made. I think 75% uh, of the people we questioned watched the, the various CSI shows on TV. and they, uh, They'd all heard that physical evidence doesn't lie and it tells you what it tells you. and It's not subject to, to being changed. And, and so we use that to our advantage and, uh, and try to compare with them how the human memory might not be perfect, but the physical evidence doesn't. It's not subject to those frailties and those problems. And it tells you what it tells you. And sometimes uh, two different people may tell you something different, but the physical evidence will show you what truly happened. So we were conditioning them on those kind of things. It's been a, it's one of those word hires, one of those jury selections in death penalty case where there was literally two-thirds of it spent in guilt innocence issues. As many of you know, the death penalty juries, so much is devoted to the death penalty. And we tried to make that be the afterthought, sort of like the state made self-defense be the afterthought. Um, whether we were successful or not, I don't know. The jury rejected the self-defense pretty routinely, and I think did what we were apprehensive they would do, is, is to just subtly change the rules of this moment, police officer. Uh, I, I want to talk about um, why you think the jury rejected the death penalty. Um, and so I, I want you to start out your answer that um, what was the topic being the jury uh, declined to impose death on Stephen Hurd and why you think that happened? Why the jury did not return a verdict or answer questions so it's death would be imposed. It's hard to predict that. Right? Let, let me stop you because this is going to be historical okay. uh, and special issues are liable to change. Okay. Let, me, let me come back and talk about that. Okay. As far as, as why the jury didn't vote in such a manner that, that death would be imposed, we talked to them afterwards. I'm not sure we've got a clear answer on that. They. Uh, we had prepared, as I said earlier, for every conceivable situation and punishment just as if one's going to happen. That's one of those things you have to work and prepare for something you hope doesn't happen, but you know there's a possibility that it will. We had, uh, he had spent over 11 years in the penitentiary out of the last 16 of his life, and we had spent a great deal of time down in the penitentiary system certainly looking at his disciplinary records, but also talking to people that had supervised him and work crews, uh, prison guards, jail guards, jail supervisors. Uh, he had worked in some uh, some work detail program as an electrician. We were able to find some people out in the Wells area that had supervised him. We went one layer deeper and went through all the qualifications you have to be on that work crew, which means you're nonviolent, you're not a discipline problem, you were a model inmate. So we were able to actually portray him as somewhat of a model inmate. I regrettably, a bunch of times, many times death penalty work, death penalty result because juries don't like your client. They don't care how they behave. Uh, we had a very compelling case that really could not be disturbed. We also had to deal with a great deal of, of gang activity and gang affiliation. State was trying to make him into a full-blown member of the Aryan Brotherhood. The fact of the matter is, he was a wannabe, and uh, we were able through some witnesses and testimony they had to show that he was nothing more than, than exactly that—a wannabe. Uh, the jury told us they were impressed at one point in time with regard to how he conducted himself and while incarcerated. Um, I'm not real sure that what jurors tell you after a verdict as far as how they arrived at something is always accurate. Uh, in fact, most of the time I think it's not accurate, but that's what they told us. Um, do you want to talk about the special issues in this case? Um, 
Okay. Um, tell me about, uh, for a lawyer who's never tried a death penalty case, um, what's different about trying and preparing a death penalty case than a regular non-death case? Well, the, uh, it goes without saying, you, when you defend a person in connection with death penalty prosecution, the, the ultimate final punishment, the uh, Supreme Court has told us death is different, and it is. Uh, I think a lawyer, and for those young lawyers who might be watching this, I, for some silly reason, have had more than my share of those cases, and have, have had some, some good results. But uh, as you approach it, you must approach a death penalty defense with the theme and theory that if all this goes south and the person's found guilty of capital murder, and especially if she's answered such a death penalty is imposed, if that person is executed some seven, eight, ten years in the future, that I can sleep fairly well that night knowing that I did everything I was supposed to do ethically. Uh, I interviewed every witness who was to be interviewed. I uh, read every case that needed to be read. I traveled across this state to search and review uh, prison records. And there was nothing that could be done that wasn't done. And that's all I can tell a young lawyer to approach this, because you have to be able to sleep well if that ever happens. Um, but you also have to try death penalty cases with some credibility. When I say that is, many, many times the, uh, the guilt innocence is, is sometimes supported by a confession with a mountain of physical evidence supporting the confession. There's not a there's not a lot of shades of gray. And I think you have to be cautious as you approach that because you've got to stand up and, and represent to a jury that this person not be executed at some point in the future. And to do that, you've got to have credibility. So it's a little bit like walking a tightrope. You have to vigorously represent your client in guilt innocence, but you've got to have credibility in punishment, which is many times where these cases are going. Um, it's a case that... Uh, death penalty case where I, I don't think you go to bed for midnight every night if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, it's a case where you're always thinking of different additional things you need to be doing. And you don't leave anything undone. So I'll let it approach you. How many death cases have you had? Possible death sentences? Yes, sir. Okay. Two, uh, two have been death sentences. Okay. One individual died in the penitentiary a year later. So. That's pretty damn good. So I want to ask you about that. I want to, uh, I'm going to ask you how many uh, cases have you had where the uh, state sought the death penalty um, and what your success rate is? A little self-serving, but it's important. It's ten. It's ten. Eight out of ten. Okay. So I think I. All right. Uh, how many death cases? It, how many cases have you had where the state sought the death penalty? And uh, what's been the outcome? Rick, since 1986, I've tried ten of these cases for to verdict where the state was seeking the death penalty. Uh, eight of those have been sentences of life. Two of those have involved death penalty. Pretty step. Uh, so you've had um, ten times in your life, Mark. You have sat down after final argument um, and ten times in your life you've sat down after final argument, watched the state give their closing, 
and had to wait to see if your client was going to live or die. That's right. Tell me what what it's like um, waiting on a jury to decide whether or not they're going to execute your client and entitle that before you go into it. I don't like to tell you what it's like. It uh, it's a very solemn period because the, the decisions are so. T title solemn. that. Title that. What I mean is, when you're waiting on the you know, the verdict to punish the verdict. When you're waiting on a sentencing verdict in a death penalty case, um, it is a very solemn period of time for me. I, if you've done what you're supposed to do, you, you should be physically, emotionally, and mentally exhausted, and you are. Um, you've sought to pack up your countless boxes and briefcases and materials and start getting that back to your office. But what I have always tried to do is know that I have a client back in that holdover typically. And he is a human being. I may not be fond of him. I may not be fond of what he's done in life. But I also know what a dreadful moment in time that is for him. And I have made a an absolute point that I do not ever let 30 minutes go by that I don't go back and tell him what might be going on as far as what jury note came out or how much time has elapsed or his mother is out here. She is still waiting because I think he's entitled to that. It, it, is, it is his life in the balance. Uh, he is either headed for death row or he is headed for the penitentiary, neither of which are, are very good options. And uh, I just think those people need a slight bit of comfort at that time. So I've always sought to do that. And if, if I'm not just having self serving, I do that to keep me busy, quite frankly. Tell me what. Um emotions you're going through when you're waiting uh, for that verdict in the, in the death case. What's it like for Mark Daniel? You've done it ten times now. Um, and I want you to start out with ten times I've had to wait and for a jury to decide whether or not my client was going to live or die and then tell me what, what your feelings are like. Waiting on a Punishment verdict in death penalty cases, it's an emotional roller coaster because, one, you have the law that the most critical question, I think, is always the what everybody calls the future dangerousness question, which has not a dang thing to do with future dangerousness. It says, is there proof beyond reasonable doubt that federal that criminal acts of violence that constitute a continued threat to society? And there's a mouthful in that. And I, I have spent so much time in jury selection final argument breaking that down into its component parts. I'm, I'm hoping a jury will follow that. Because it's almost something if they if they read it if they read it as specifically as they should and broke it down, it's almost a, such a difficult thing to be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. But so many juries do it because they they're reckless, scared, and paint with a broad brush. So part of my prayer is that they at least approach this meticulously and cautiously and carefully in following the law, but also knowing the consequences of the flow. Now, from my standpoint, um, I don't want to hear the words and the answers that, that result in the death penalty. I have, I have fought for months getting ready. I have fought the case for two to three months. Um, I don't like to lose, and I don't like that ultimately penalty is part of the loss. So, sure, I have an emotional attachment to want to hear the right answers, but uh, I also know that uh, it may not turn out my way. And uh, again, I fall back on the, I guess, the, the concept that I know full well I've done what I was supposed to do. I don't know what else I could have done. And uh, I have a little peace in that. Probably end with this because our hour is yeah. almost up. Um, <clears throat> so many lawyers, in general, not just criminal lawyers, have such a hard time balancing what we do every day with our families. Uh, and you see so many lawyers whose families are broken and torn apart, probably because the lawyer was selfish uh, and was more concerned about their career than the obligation to their family. So. What advice do you have for um, for
for lawyers out there practicing to, to have the proper balance in life, to keep family and work in the proper mix? Rick, that's a wonderful question. Now, tell me the, tell me what the question your, your question was, what should a lawyer do to keep in balance his personal life, his family, and still hopefully have a successful career? And, and so many people have struggled with that. I've been privileged to serve on grievance committees in connection with professional enhancement programs. We dealt with many lawyers that had depression, had problems. Uh, I wish I had the, the, the perfect answer. I, I'll offer some lawyers some advice. Um, what we do is, is demanding. Uh, it takes countless hours. It takes hours away from, from your family, your wife, and your children. Uh, we don't work at Lockheed or Bell Helicopter go home at five every day. And I spend a lot of Saturdays working. I spend a few Sundays working. I'm the first to admit it. And I think one day when I go to my grave, I'll wish I'd worked less Saturdays and less Sundays. But. Uh, I think lawyers need to do one of several things. They need to begin by ensuring they protect their health. Uh, what we do is so physically demanding. If uh, when I first started practicing law back in 1980, I remember a number of lawyers would go have a drink every evening after work, and that drink wasn't one; it was two, three, or four. And I remember sitting around. And I've been a lawyer about six months around a bar with some guys, and I was watching them smoke and watching them drink their fifth drink of the night. I probably had my third, and, and, and a light came on in my head that these guys may not have as long a life expectancy as, as maybe they should. And I made a commitment at that time, it's a commitment I try to abide by to this day. I do not consume alcohol during the week. From a Sunday to a Thursday, I do not drink a drop of alcohol. I might have one drink on the weekend, night, or Friday or Saturday, and no more. That's a commitment I've made. Uh, I, take very good care of myself. I exercise regularly. Uh, and I think you first off take care of your health. Now as far as your family balance, uh, I've learned something from Rick Hagen. Rick Hagen involves his, his wife actually taking care of things at his office, uh, books and that sort of thing. I actually don't have that, so my wife's not really that involved in my office. I try to set aside time every weekend to devote specifically to children's activities, and I don't do enough of that. Um, I think lawyers need to find a way to move things around and prioritize that time with, with families, whether it's wives or children. Uh, as I sit here today in 2007, I've got a 17-year-old, 15-year-old, and I'm looking two years down the pike, they're going to be gone. And uh, it, uh, I'll offer one free piece of advice. In the last couple of years, I've actually involved them in a little bit of what I do. I've, I'm taking them down to the, the Huntsville, Texas Criminal Trial College with me every year where they can watch us teach and see see what lawyers do. They can see what their dad does. And I'm encouraging them to come to the courtrooms and I'm trying something. They can see that I don't just go to work and come home, but I do something during the day. And what's really neat is they're, they're taking an interest in that you know, just because they're, I mean, they enjoy doing it. It's fascinating to them. Not that they want to become a lawyer or try a lawyer, but not only do you need to be involved in your children's activities, find a way to involve your children in your activities. And there comes an age when they will actually have an interest and want to know what it's about, and want to know who the judge is, and what a judge is, and who's those people on the other side of the room. Uh, and we need to do more of that. I, I know so many people that their children really don't even know what they do, and that's sad. We're done. That's an hour.